Preaching and Leadership Conference is back and celebrating 10 years of teaching, preaching, and healing. Join us in person on April 18th through 20th at the Westin Hotel in Southfield, Michigan, hosted by the one and only Dr. Dr. E.L. Branch. Prepare to hear the anointed voices of Dr. Alvin Bernstein, Dr. Willie Francois III, Dr. Carolyn Knight, Dr. Janae Pitts Murdoch, and Dr. Frank Thomas. Visit elbranchministries.com for registration and more information. It's It's the the Voice Voice of a Prophet Prophet, Preaching Preaching and Leadership Leadership Conference. Conference. Don't wait. Register now, and we'll see you in Southfield, Michigan on April 18th, 2024. The Voice of a Prophet Preaching and Leadership Conference is back and celebrating 10 years of teaching, preaching, and healing. Join us in person on April 18th through 20th at the Westin Hotel in Southfield, Michigan, hosted by the one and only Dr. Dr. E.L. Branch. Prepare to hear the anointed voices of Dr. Alvin Bernstein, Dr. Willie Francois III, Dr. Carolyn Knight, Dr. Janae Pitts Murdoch, and Dr. Frank Thomas. Visit elbranchministries.com for registration and more information. It's It's the the Voice of a Prophet Prophet, Preaching and Leadership Leadership Conference. Conference. Don't wait. Register now. And we'll see you in Southfield, Michigan on April 18th, 2024. The Voice of a Prophet Preaching and Leadership Conference is back and celebrating 10 years of teaching, preaching, and healing. Join us in person on April 18th through 20th at the Westin Hotel in Southfield, Michigan, hosted by the one and only Dr. Dr. E.L. Branch. Prepare to hear the anointed voices of Dr. Alvin Bernstein, Dr. Willie Francois III, Dr. Carolyn Knight, Dr. Janae Pitts Murdoch, and Dr. Frank Thomas. Visit elbranchministries.com for registration and more information. It's It's the the Voice of a Prophet Prophet, Preaching and Leadership Leadership Conference. Conference. Don't wait. Register now, and we'll see you in Southfield, Michigan on April 18th, 2024. Greetings, and welcome to Bible Talks. I'm Pastor E.L. Branch, and I'm grateful to God for this opportunity to be together once again in Bible study. You know, I want to express my thanks to Pastor Lawrence Glass and Minister April Rogers, who hosted Bible Talks in my absence. And they both did a magnanimous job with the books that they covered. So thank you for loving on them and for providing feedback and fill in the comment section with your thoughts and expressions, you know. So thank you, thank you, thank you one and all for your consistent support and prayers as we continue this journey through the books of the Bible. And then, of course, as usual, we are taking our time as we give time for our partners to sign on with us. You know, we are all so busy and then there's always so much going on, isn't it? And so we are are just holding out for those who are signing on to be a part of this evening. And uh, I want to express again, you know, my uh, deep appreciation, you know, for all of you for your continued prayers and your support uh, of El Branch Ministries and of Bible Talks. We really do appreciate that. And then my brothers and sisters, Bible Talks for this evening is pre-recorded due to an event being held in Detroit where Nikki Branch Penson is being honored by the Michigan Chronicle as one of the women of excellence. So by now, Sister Linnell and I are in the audience for this much deserved honor. So, you know, continue your prayers for us and with us. But we wanted to be here to share uh, in this uh, special time together because every Thursday evening at six o'clock central time, seven o'clock Eastern time is just our opportunity to be together. And so I am just so grateful for all of you for your continued support. So please continue to reach out to somebody and invite them to be a part of this evening's experience as we take a look at the book of First Chronicles. You know, so reach out to somebody. I know that uh, our faithful supporters are there, and I'm really, really grateful for all of you. You know, the Lord has brought us a long way together, and for that, I am extremely grateful. 
And so listen, reach out to somebody, you know, make that call, you know, send that text, whatever it is that you do to get others, you know, to be a part of this uh, experience, uh, because this is a time that we really do want to share together. We want to share this together. Let's look to the Lord in prayer as we begin our Bible talk for this evening. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God, thank you for this amazing day and thank you for your keeping power. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives, for your daily provisions and your protection. We give you glory, honor, and praise. Now, Lord, we pray your presence with us as we share this time together in Bible Talks. God, I pray that you will indeed meet us here and that you would touch lives, touch hearts, change minds. And God, I pray for every family, every home, every individual who is sharing with us and those who are yet to, to become a part of this evening's experience. I pray, God, that you would just work in a mighty way in all of our lives because you know our needs before we can even ask you. So God, meet every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And God, we pray that you would just enrich us through your word, for your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Be with us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings on all of you. Well, here we are. We are at the book of First Chronicles, the book of First Chronicles. So get your notepads, you know, your pencils or pens or whatever it is, you know, that you use, you know, you can uh, do it electronically or you can do it like I do, you know, make make those notes by hand, but get, get your uh, notepads together uh, because we are going to go ahead and delve into this book of First Chronicles. Now, Chronicle is defined as factual written accounts of important or historical events in the order of their occurrence. It is the detailed story of a person, place, or thing. It places on record whatever is known about a particular entity from the perspective of history. The book of First Chronicles gives us the historical events in the life of the household of Israel from its beginning up to the time of the writing. This book was believed to have been written by Ezra, Ezra, and I think that's fitting because Ezra was a scribe or recorder of history and held a prominent role in the history of Israel. It is fortunate, you know, when any people have their history recorded. Yeah, and when it is put into writing, you know, it is important and it is fortunate of any people of any family to have their history recorded in writing. One of the challenges for African Americans is that much of our history was not written. We were a people of oral tradition where stories were passed on from mouth to mouth without being written down. And that poses lots of problems. Oral history gets lost in the translation. It is subject to embellishments and errors due to misunderstandings. And as time passes, the meaning and use of words shift. And we struggle to hold all of the pieces of our history together. Fortunate for Israel, there were scribes like Ezra who wrote down on record the events in the life of Israel as well as the people who played a role in the development of that history. Genealogies were kept so that people were linked with their rightful families and kinships were well established and kept in order. 
Every family needs their own first and second chronicles. You know, you know, you know, it would make all of the difference in the world. The book of First Chronicles began with a long list of names and who begot whom after Jerusalem had been sacked by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Some of the people of Israel were taken captive into Babylon, while others remained in the city of Jerusalem. This was a trying period in the life of Israel, and during this time, it was important to keep families together to the extent possible. So a quick scan of the genealogy reveals the fact that the record goes all the way back to the beginning. It starts with Adam, the first man. This is significant because the household of Israel is linked to Adam and therefore has a connection with all people of the earth. Then the lineage follows Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. How about that? And then it continues through their descendants. And that's what these chapters are filled with. These first few chapters of the book of First Chronicles is filled with all of the genealogies and who begot whom. And it is so important. You know, and, and uh, while we rarely, you know, take time, you know, to really, you know, look at all of these genealogies and try to figure them out and make sure the connections, you know, are correct and who belongs to whom and who is related to whom. We rarely look at all of that stuff, but it is important. And I challenge you, you know, just take a little time when you get a chance to give some attention to the genealogies in this book. You see, chapter two outlines the house of Jacob, and it gives us again the sons of Jacob, who were known as the tribes of Israel. Chapter three gives us the sons of David, the king and the psalmist of Israel. It is not until chapter four that we reach the narrative of Israel and encounter a man by the name of Jabez. We will take a look at Jabez. And so the scripture that I want us to read is found in First Chronicles, the fourth chapter, verses nine and 10. First Chronicles chapter four, verses nine and 10. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers and his mother called his name Jabez saying, because I bore him in pain and Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. See, we are introduced to Brother Jabez in chapter four out of all the names that have been called and the families that have grown exponentially. Just two verses, two verses contain all the information we will receive about this unique character and the story that makes him stand out in Israel's history. Jabez was an honorable man, and the Bible tells us about him in a sweeping comparison of Jabez to his brothers. Now, we know nothing about Jabez's siblings. However, the suggestion is that they were of questionable character. Jabez is introduced to us as being more honorable than his brothers. 
depending upon the level of dishonor of Jabez's brothers, we are not quite certain if this was a compliment or not. The record also tells us that Jabez's mother named him and his name was deliberately chosen because it describes the pain in which his mother bore him. Jabez's name means pain. How about that? How would you like to have a name that means pain? And Jabez represented pain all his life. Every time his name was called, it represented pain. To look at Jabez was to see the pain he brought upon his mother at his birth. Jabez, pain, pain, Jabez. Well, the very next thing that we learn about Jabez is that he had a relationship with God. Yeah, he had a relationship with the God of Israel. The scripture says that Jabez called upon the God of Israel. Jabez asked God for blessings and that the hand of God would be upon him. And within Jabez's prayer was a request for enlarged territory. It could well be that Jabez wanted larger space to rise above what was commonly ascribed to him. Jabez wanted to live above and beyond the pain that his name represented. He needed larger territory to do that. Yes, indeed. Also included in the prayer of Jabez was a request to be kept from evil. Did you see that? You know, a request to be kept from evil. It was likely that Jabez had his share of run-ins with evil. We all have. Jabez's prayer was to be kept from evil. Now, this was a request for the time and energy to grow some more and to develop spiritual muscle enough to keep from losing all the time. You see, it is one thing to request that evil be kept away from us, but quite another for us to be kept away from evil. You know, I hope you got that. I hope you got that. You see, he did not pray that evil be kept away from him, but that he be kept away from evil. You see, Jabez noted the stiff and punishing tendency within us that craves trouble and rebellion. Yeah, there's something about us, there's something inside us that craves trouble. <laughs> we, you know, I mean, every time we look up, there we are in some kind of trouble or another. Wow. See, were it not for the prayers to be kept from evil, there is no telling what would become of us. But look, the Bible says that Jabez received from God just what he wanted. Yeah, his prayers were answered according to his request. How many of us can say that, that we receive the answer to our prayers just as we requested? So let's look again at Jabez's prayer. First, he asked to be blessed indeed by God. You know, and now, you know, I, 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 I listen carefully and I read carefully and underline you know, that whole thing where it says, bless me indeed. You see, bless me indeed. I mean, it's one thing to say, bless me. But then when you say, bless me indeed, that means that I need blessings on top of blessings. That means I need blessings in situations, you know, where I don't know what to do or what to say. I need blessings on top of blessings. Bless me 
indeed. It's one thing to be blessed, but it's another thing to be blessed indeed. The angel bears asked for enlarged territory. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and, and that, that that's a prayer that most of us can pray as well. Lord, enlarge my territory. Yeah, you know, and as you live in this world and as you serve and as you give of yourself to others and as you use the gifts of God in you, you know, it becomes necessary for your boundaries to be expanded. Help me somebody. Yeah, so that your territory needs to be enlarged. There's a whole lot of people who have outgrown their territory and are praying to God like Brother Jabez for enlarged territory. Then also, he asked that the hand of God accompany him. That means I need the hand. And when we talk about the hand of the Lord, we're talking about the power of the Lord. So that God is at work and God is busy around us and God is making ways and opening doors for us as we go. Yeah, so that the hand of the Lord to accompany him. And finally, Jabez requested to be kept from evil so that he caused pain to no one. And I think that the prayer of Jabez is a good prayer to be prayed anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances. Jabez's prayer has actually become a model prayer for all of us. And we know so little about Brother Jabez. However, what we do know is enough to make us take notice of him and his prayer life. And so after we meet Brother Jabez, the lengthy genealogy in First Chronicles pauses just long enough for us to become acquainted with Brother Jabez. So let's get the lesson that we need to learn from him to help make us a better people for the kingdom. Well, let's run to First Chronicles, the sixth chapter, Verses 31 and 32. First Chronicles 6, verses 31 and 32. Now these are the men whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord. After the ark came to rest. They were ministering with music before the dwelling place of the tabernacle meeting until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And they served in their office according to their order. Amen and praise God. See, what stands out here in these verses that are also incidental to the continued census record is the order of music ministry as an integral part of the worship service in the tabernacle. Did you catch that? Yeah. Music ministry is an integral part of the worship service in the tabernacle. Music is and always has been important to worship. See, somebody need to catch that right there. Need to catch that right there. You know, because sometimes people ask, you know, why do we always need music? Why we always got to have music and singing and all of that instruments, you know, and all of the different types of instruments. Well, it's right here in the word of God is right here in the word of God. Notice that the Chronicles tell us that King David appointed these musicians and they continued to serve in their respective positions until after Solomon's temple was constructed approximately 20 years or more later. You see, the Ark of God represented the divine presence. And wherever God was, that was the place of worship. 
And whenever and wherever worship occurred, music was an important part of it. You see, music was always a part of the worship experience. And some of us, some of us, you know, I mean, whether or not we have an instrument, whether or not we have somebody, you know, that's gifted with the most melodious voice, you know, for some of us, you know, music just comes to us, you know, don't it? Don't it? You know, I, I hope somebody hear what I'm saying and you, you are responding now and, and sending up some hearts and some likes, you know, because you understand how important music is to the whole idea of worship. So kudos to the musicians and singers who are gifted of God to lead people in worship and to prepare the hearts and minds of the people for the presence of God. My, my, my. That is so, so important. I thought we should, you know, I thought we should just grab that passage, you know, right out of there, you know, those few verses, because it is so, so important to understand the place of music, the role of music, the importance of music and gifted musicians and singers, you know, as a part of the full spectrum of true spiritual worship. My God, my God. Yes, indeed. So I thought that was important for us to take note of. But let's go on. Let's read First Chronicles, the 11th chapter. We are doing some skipping around, but here we go. The 11th chapter, verses 7 through 9. First Chronicles 11, verses 7 through 9. Then David dwelt in the stronghold. Therefore, they called it the city of David. And he built a city around it. From the Milo to the surrounding area. Joab repaired the rest of the city. So David went on and became great. And the Lord of hosts was with him. I thought it significant for us to highlight the arrival of David to Jerusalem as king over all Israel. Before now, David has occupied the throne, but his central location was at Hebron. Ever since King Saul was gone, David was on the rise as God's anointed. However, it was not until Jerusalem was captured that David relocated his throne to the capital. Once David conquered the Jebusites and took control of Jerusalem, they began calling Jerusalem the city of David. After King David relocates the throne to Jerusalem, Israel's army expands exponentially. David immediately increases in strength and power, and the wealth of Israel reaches peak proportions. Israel is the world power that they once only dreamed of. King David continues to lead Israel's armies in battle, and they conquer lands and defeat their enemies. David, of course, as you all know, was a warrior. Yeah, David was a warrior. David led the host, meaning the armies of Israel, in warfare against their enemies, and they conquered lands. That's how Israel grew as a nation and actually became the nation that they wanted to be. It all happened under the leadership of King David. And while we know, yes, we do, don't we? We know that there were flaws in David's life. There was flaws in his character. There was moral failure on the part of King David. However, God continued to bless him no matter what, King David would do, 
he would always turn and repent to the Lord. As one of the things I said before, and I'll say it again about David, is that David always knew his way back to the heart of God. Yes, he always knew his way back to the heart of God. And David conquered as king, and he built a great nation as king, all by the grace of God, and because God promised to be with him. Now let's read 1 Chronicles, the 13th chapter, verses 9 through 12. 1 Chronicles 13, verses 9 through 12. And when they came to Chidon's threshing floor, Yusa put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Yusa, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Yusa. Therefore, that place is called Perez Yusa to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God to me? Well, this is one of the most intriguing stories in the book of 1 Chronicles. It is an intriguing story. There is a world of mystery surrounding this text. I remember hearing one of my late friends, Reverend James E. Flakes, preach from this text. He called it, and David was afraid of God that day. Dr. Flakes was a masterful preacher. You see, while the ark of God was being transported in an ox cart, the oxen stumbled and it looked as if the ark might fall. One of the attendants assigned the responsibility of transporting the ark by the name of Yusa, reached out and grabbed hold to the ark to keep it from falling. I'm sure Brother Yusa thought he was doing the responsible thing. He did what any of us probably would have done under the same circumstances. He saw something sacred and special like the ark of God toppling over. It may have been upon natural reflexes that Yusa reached out and held on to the ark to keep it from falling to the ground. God responded to use his actions with anger. God was angry with Yusa for touching the ark. Nobody touches the ark. The ark of God was carried with poles through a set of golden rings so that nobody's hand would ever have to come in contact with the ark. However, this was a unique set of circumstances. The ark was being carried in a rickety ox cart that threatened the safety of something so precious. Everybody was probably on edge thinking that the ark was in danger of falling and being damaged. When all of a sudden, the team of oxen get tripped up and lose their balance and the ark appears to be falling. Yusa instinctively grabs the ark to protect it. Yusa is being protective and goes into safety mode and rescues the ark from falling. That's all he does. That's all he does. However, what Yusa does makes God angry. God is so angry that God strikes Yusa dead right on the spot. How about that? Yusa's death sends David into an emotional tailspin. David is wondering what the what, what is up with God? 
Why did God strike Yusa down like that? Why did, what did Yusa do that was wrong? This entire ordeal sends all of us into a tailspin, doesn't it? We all wonder what's going on. What is the crime in saving the ark from falling? That's a good thing, isn't it? Well, Dr. Flakes unfolded the mystery by saying that the ark of God never needs human protection. I pause to let that soak in. The ark of God never needs human protection. Even when it is carried in a rickety ox cart, the ark is always safe in itself. And just the fact that Yusa believed the ark could fall upset God. Just the fact that Yusa believed the ark could fall. And to add to that, for Yusa to think that he could save the ark heightened God's rage even more. Oh, my God. Just the fact that Yusa thought the ark could fall and that Yusa thought that he could save the ark. It heightened God's rage. So God struck Yusa dead so that no one else harbored any ideas that they could save the ark of God. My, 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 my. Well, I told you this is one of the mysteries. <laughs> this is one of the mysterious stories that is tucked away in First Chronicles. And there's some more stuff up in there. You know, we just have to read it. We just have to read it. And I hope that you will take some time, you know, to read it uh, at your leisure. Yeah, but this, this is something. This is something. But I'm so, so grateful for my late friend and brother, Dr. James E. Flakes, who unfolded that to us. Think about it. I think it makes sense. I think it does. It makes sense. Let's go on. Let's read 1 Chronicles 21, verses 24 through 26. Then King David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offering. Well, you know, we looked at this same Bible story in the book of 2 Samuel. But here again, it is repeated in the Chronicles. And we encounter this same, you know, of several events in Israel history. It is written in the Kings and it is written in the Chronicles. You know, so we will see uh, stories with just a little variation, you know, maybe a little bit of variation. However, the, the main stories are, some of them are repeated. And I think that there's a spiritual value in that as well. However, here the focus is on the offering of God, that which costs us nothing, okay? 
that that's what that's what this point is this is about offering god something that costs us nothing you see david refused to accept the threshing floor of ornan as a gift and then offer it to god see david realized that doing so was not only deceitful but it was just plain wrong. If David received the threshing floor as a gift from Ornan, that would mean it costed him nothing. And Ornan was only being generous and a good citizen. Ornan was only showing respect and honor to the king. However, David had to do the right thing. He was already in a bad place because he had violated the will of God. You remember, don't you? He had taken a census of the army when, in fact, he should not have. So David was already dealing with the wrath of God upon his life. And to make the wrong move at this time would only exacerbate the situation. The wrong move would make bad matters worse. You see, it is clear to us from the latter clause of verse 26 that David did the right thing. Yeah, that David did the right thing. Because when he purchased the threshing floor and then built an altar of burnt offerings upon that threshing floor, then he was able to actually offer something up to God, something that was his, something that he paid a dear price for, and something that was valued and treasured. You see, David needed to hear from God with urgency and also with favor. David paid the price for Ornan's threshing floor and built an altar unto the Lord. What David offered God was something that David paid for full price. You see, the lesson for you and me is to always remember that what we do for Christ should be from our hearts and should be done with the highest level of sincerity. Yeah, the hard work we put in to be pleasing to God is well worth it. We should never, ever look for the easy way out when it comes to the things of God. All our labors in the kingdom are labors of love. Did you hear what I just said? All of our labors in the kingdom are labors of love. We do what we do because we love the Lord. Ask me, ask any Christian, ask any mature child of God, why do you do what you do? And they will respond by saying, I do what I do because I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I'm motivated by love. I'm prompted by love. I'm guided by love. Love become the perimeters around my actions and my behaviors, my love for God. I do it because I love the Lord. See, this is what it's all about. And when we love God, then we won't just toss God just any old thing. You know, we don't just toss God just any old thing because we don't feel like working hard. We don't feel like putting in the necessary time and labor. We don't toss God anything because we already tired and worn. No, we've got to give God our best. You see, I'm from the old school. <laughs> you know, I started writing sermons before there were computers. I didn't know anything about no computer. Didn't know anything about even an electric typewriter. When I started as a preacher, 
I started writing sermons with my hand on letter sized paper. I would write 10 to 12 pages front and back and then paper clip them together. You see, writing out my sermons by hand was indeed hard work along with all of the study that was required. However, it was the work required of me if I was going to be the preacher God called me to be. I had to do the work. And I might be talking to some younger preacher right now saying, look, you know, this thing requires work. If we are going to be the preachers and the leaders and the people that God has called us to be, it's going to take some work. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And so I used to write out my sermons by hand. It was hard work. Paper clipped them together. Then I would put them in shoe boxes. And I had several shoe boxes that were full of sermons that I had handwritten and then stacked away. Didn't even have engagements to preach them, you know. I had more sermons than I had engagements. But I kept writing sermons and I kept studying. I kept reading and I kept doing the necessary research. I kept my face in the word of God because I wanted to be the preacher that God had called me to be. So every now and then, with all the technology that we have, I still go back to writing my sermons by hand. I've discovered, you know, in all of these years, that if I want something to really be written on my mind and on my heart, I write it by hand. I write it by hand. You see, it's the price that I pay to be the preacher that God has called me to be. It's my offering back to God for God thinking enough of me to call me and to use me. It's the price that I pay. And so I can't just throw God anything. No, I've got to work. I've got to prepare. I can't just toss God anything. No, I will not, like David said, offer unto the Lord that which cost me nothing. So I still go back to writing my sermons by hand sometimes. Yes, indeed. It's the labor of love involved in reading hard copy books. <laughs> Some, you know, yeah, yeah I'm reading hard copy books. You can see the bookshelves behind me and that's not a virtual thing behind me. Those are some of my books. You know, reading hard copy books and underlining quotes in order to put in the study time necessary. I dare not offer to God that which costs me nothing. And I say to all of you, my brothers and sisters, whatever it is that you are called of God to do, whatever God has gifted you to be able to do in the work of the kingdom, make sure that you put in the, the work that's necessary, the time that's required, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears that it may take for you to be the servant of God that the Lord has called you to be. I think I'm preaching about now, you know, but, but I just wanted you to hear that because, because I think that the lesson for us from this final passage that we're reading is that we should never, no, we should never shortchange God. We should never do less than our best. We should never offer up to the Lord that which costs us nothing. We honor God like David did when we pay the price, pay the price for whatever it is 
that we are offering up to the Lord. Wow. Well, <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. And, you know, uh, I, I, you know, we, we want to entertain questions. So if there are questions, I want to encourage you to just go ahead and put them in the comment section. Just put them in the comment section. You know, whatever your expressions are, whatever thoughts or feelings may be on your mind and your heart, you know, go ahead and put them in the comment section. And uh, we will hopefully get a time to respond to them at a later date. And I will certainly be checking it to read them for myself and to uh, hear your responses to this uh, Bible talk from First Chronicles. All right. So, uh, so be sure and uh, say something to us in the comments section. So now I want to offer an invitation to Christian discipleship just in case somebody needs to receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal savior. I want you to know that if you invite the Lord in, he will come into you according to his word. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone would open to me, I will come into them and sup with them and they with me. He will save you right now. If you have a prayer request, please share that prayer request with us as well in the comments section so that we can stand with you in prayer. Your care is our prayer. And the Bible says the fervent effectual prayers of the righteous avails much. And then let me encourage you to give. This is our giving time, and I want you to know that you can share in giving through Givelify, through Givelify at EL Branch Ministries. That's Givelify at EL Branch Ministries. Share a good gift. You can even set up recurring gifts through Givelify so that each Thursday or whatever time during the week you desire that your gift can flow automatically. And of course, you have full control of it to start it or end it at any time. But you can give recurring gifts through Givelify. You can also give through Cash App at dollar sign ELB Ministries, dollar sign ELB Ministries. And let me thank you in advance for your generous support of El Branch Ministries. Next week, we will talk from the book of Second Chronicles. Wow, if you think we had a good time with First Chronicles, just wait till next week. Second Chronicles, please look forward and pray forward to receiving what God has for us from this next book of the Bible. And there are numerous services happening for Good Friday. And I'm sure each of you will find yourself worshiping at one or more of the various ministries. I will be preaching on Good Friday, March 29th at 6.30 p.m. at the New Nazareth Baptist Church, 7933 South Yates Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60617. That's the New Nazareth Baptist Church. 7933 South Yates Boulevard in Chicago, Illinois, 60617, where the Reverend Dr. Jarvis Hanson is pastor. Please hold us up in your prayers. Hold us up in your prayers. Well, the voice of a prophet preaching and leadership conference will be held on April the 18th through 20th 2024 at the Western Hotel in Southfield, Michigan. Our theme is Revival of the Heart. We're looking forward to a special and sacred time together as we interact up close with our God-anointed presenters. We will have Drs. Alvin Bernstein, Willie Francois, Carolyn Knight, R. Janae Pitts Murdoch, and Frank A. Thomas sharing with us 
through preaching, teaching, and storytelling. This is our 10th anniversary edition of VOAP, and we are expecting a mighty move of God as we share together in this in-person conference. Register now, because our deadline for registration is April the 12th. That's our deadline, April the 12th. So be sure to get registered as soon as you possibly can. And I'm wishing all of you a happy Resurrection Sunday. I know you will attend the church of your choice and will give glory to God as we celebrate the resurrection. So God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord, thank you for this time that you've allowed us to share together. Now, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to be with us and keep us and cover us until we can come together again. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. God bless you and God keep you.